Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Lone Vic and today it's another episode of Honest Talk, a series in which I'm talking about my subjective opinions and feelings about games that I have in my collection that I've played for some time now and that I'm ready to share with you guys. Hopefully those opinions might help you in deciding whether you want a game on your shelf or you're just interested in hearing other people's perspectives on a game that you already own or are interested in. Today, in this episode, as you can see all around me, it's all about Skyrim, the board game from Modifius Entertainment that I was waiting for for quite a long time. I can't say quite a long time because between the Kickstarter and the delivery, the time on this game was impressively short. I can't tell you the exact numbers right now, but I don't think that it was even a year before I pledged the Kickstarter and got the boxes in my house. So that was pretty impressive from the guys. And as a fan of the computer game, it was a no-brainer for me to try out the game and see whether the, it's good, the board game I mean. And if it weren't, I would just try to resell it and, you know, make some room for other games on my shelf. But whether that's the case, you'll see after watching this video. If you like the content that I'm providing here on my channel and if you would like to help the channel grow, you can always click the like button under the video. You can hit the subscribe and ring the notification bell to be notified about new videos on my channel. And if you feel like it, in the description to the video there is a link if you want to buy me a cup of coffee. And now we will go into my honest opinion about Skyrim. The video will be traditionally divided into the good category, the not so good category. Remember that all opinions here are subjective and hopefully honest. I'm trying not to sugarcoat anything about games that I don't like, but if I like something I'm really open about that. And later on at the end a short summary so starting with the good, the first thing that struck me when I was playing this game is that this is almost, and I'm saying almost here with a little tiny reservation, this is almost the game that I always wanted Runebound to be. Because it has a lot of elements that are in my book, in my opinion, in my head, similar to Runebound. Now, I grant you that I've played the third edition of Runebound a long time ago, it was the last time, and I kind of got fed up with that game and I let it go on to a different owner, my copy. But I remember this game as a game where everybody was doing something on the main board and was having adventures, usually on their own, sometimes teaming up, and then there was a boss fight, and if you were leveled up and you had enough gear you could basically defeat the boss, and if not, the land fell into darkness and chaos and everybody was doomed, right? In a very big nutshell. You might criticize me for that in the comments, that I'm just boiling down Runebound to something like that, but this is not a video about that game, this is a video about Skyrim, so I'm just giving the headlines in this case, right? And now Skyrim kind of repeats the process. So this is kind of like a semi-co-op game for one to four players, in which every Every person has their own personal quests or can have their own personal quests. Every player can have some agenda that they want to pursue around the map. You need to level up, you need to look for new gear, you need to hone your skills, but ultimately the main quest for the chapter is going to be done by a few characters in cooperation and some of the other quests might be done as well by a few characters in cooperation. So you, you, you go on your separate adventures but sometimes you just meet at some point and you go okay so now we are ready to go to this dungeon and do it together? Yeah sure, boom, let's go. It has those cooperative elements, but it's like everybody has their own adventure. But the difference between this and Runebound is that this has a very strong overarching narrative. So the chapters in the campaign, in the main box, form a story that you are propelling through and that you are kind of shaping together with the people. And I mean shaping because there is this idea that sometimes if you take out a card with a story and you, for example, want to do something or not do something else. Those stories will branch, which will influence what options you will have later on in the game. So you're kind of shaping the world a bit. Sometimes you will decide that an event card that you are taking or a town card has to be discarded because you are doing something with it and then no other player will be able to access this card anymore. So you're changing the world a bit. It's not a 
constant like it was in Runebound, for example, or a lot of other dungeon-dwelling adventure games or something like that. And it's not a dungeon-dwelling game per se. You don't have like a dungeon map where you're going and killing monsters. Here you're, you have a gigantic map of Skyrim. You can see not even half of it is on your screen right now in front of me because it doesn't fit. It's like a 2 by 4 fold board, so it's very big. And you're going through all those lands, traveling and doing a dungeon here, doing a dungeon there, doing an adventure here, a quest there and so forth and so on. And this is like a very general plus, but in my book this this overarching narrative combined with this kind of rune-boundish sense of adventure and exploration on the map and giving you a sense of purpose of going into different places and still continuing like the same story, be it your own or end or the main quest narrative, is really something and I really feel it and it's really cool. You can check out the solo tutorial playthrough that I'm doing, even in this very small snippet of a story you can see that there is some kind of a branching narrative going on over there and that there are some side quests that you are doing and it all fits into the well mood of the game, the original, where you, you basically left the main story alone for 200 hours and you were just off doing side quests. That's definitely it. The second thing is that this is, like I said, a semi-co-op game, so you're not cooperating all the time and it escapes this dominant player trope very much and that's something that I like here as well so there is no risk that there will be one player who will be telling everybody what to do like it's sometimes with some co-op games and with some players so here everybody's doing their own thing and sometimes you go hey okay so now I think we're ready to start heading for the main story so let's maybe do that let's agree on doing that and we're, we're doing this right one co-op element that is also here are the world quests that you can do because if you don't do them they can over time expire and this will always have some negative consequences and also the strongholds can fall into unrest and become closed for visitors or something like that and you won't be able to use the markets and this is something that all the players have to watch out for together kind of collectively let's say but other than that really the domination of one player here is almost impossible everybody's playing their own sometimes helping each other now Let's go to the mechanical side as well, because I've said a lot about the kind of feel of the game. Speaking mechanically, this game revolves a lot around two things. A lot about doing some quests and skill tests related to those quests and combat. And both of those mechanics are pretty easy to get used to and pretty easy to learn. The skill tests a lot easier than the combat. The combat is a bit longer. But the important thing is that the combat is not long enough for it to be boring or droll after a while. So when you are fighting some dungeon, the other players don't have to wait for like 15 minutes scratching their heads before you finish doing what you're doing and that they can move and, you know, propel the gameplay along. It's a bit faster with rolling dice and, you know, checking the results and so forth and so on. But it's not very simplistic. There is a bit of tactic there. It, when it comes to the skill test and the combat as well, you can calculate your odds pretty well when it comes to what symbols you can roll on the dice and how much chances you have to ha get a hit or pass the test. There are some very good options for pushing your luck mechanics, so to mitigate the dice results, providing you have the resources to do it, you can always push your luck a bit and add some additional rolls and see whether you can pass the test or, you know, hit that skill for combat. So this is pretty good because in a game that's combat heavy and test heavy and you do everything with dice, which are random, let's agree, some kind of mitigation mechanic, in this case push your luck, is very much welcome. So it's good that it's there and it's good that it's so uh, handy and available. The only thing that you need are the resources for that. Now the other thing is your characters. And the fact that, as in every respectful RPG, you can equip them with 
everything you would imagine you can in a standard RPG. So you've got your headgear, you have your one or two handed weapons or spells in your hands, you've got your armor, you've got your boots, you've got your trinkets, you've got your potions, uh, you can have some statuses, you've got a backpack which is limited in capacity. So like in Skyrim you had the weight problem usually when carrying something and being overcumbered. Here you've got a limit of cards that you can put into your backpack and you have a limit of two personal quests. So you won't be doing like a Skyrim quest log where you have 50 something entries and you're wondering which one to do right now. No, two personal quests, a few world quests on the map and one main quest and that's it. That's maximum you can get. This is enough definitely enough for the whole game. You've got three types of resources basically. You've got ore, you've got herbs or plants, and you've got the soul gems that you are spending for different things, for leveling your weapons, crafting weapons, uh, enchantments, pushing your luck things, healing yourself, different stuff basically. You've got your XP and you've got your coins which you spend as well to buy some resources and stuff like that. So very very standard stuff but it works very very well. And also let's talk about the amount of content. Now the adventure game scenario book, as you can see, this is the one from the core box. It has the tutorial at the end upside down, but the whole scenario book is basically eight pages long. So it has two campaigns, each campaign having three chapters. So you're doing six chapters all in all. But do not be deceived because those six chapters all in all are covered by this many numbered cards. So this is like almost 500 cards, 400 something cards here in the base game. And those are cards filled with quests, filled with events, filled with some uh, personal narratives and stuff like that, branching decisions, people that you are going to meet that will give you quests and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff. Those campaigns might not be the longest ones you've ever played, but each chapter will give you a lot of content and a lot of story thanks to those cards. And you will have to take a lot of decisions. You will have to do a lot of quests and stuff like that. So they will be full. And this is a good thing because this is not a game that you'll be playing like, for example, Gloomhaven or Aeon Trespass. This is like a year from now and we're still in the third quarter of the campaign. No, this is something that if you have a regular group, you are going to finish the main campaign in like, I don't know, four or five sessions if you're going well and if you're not losing the game uh, too much. And that's that's okay. That's okay for a story and for the content and for the price tag. That, that's very much okay. And then you've got the expansions which add to the stories and they also add some hundreds of cards into this deck and they add some new equipment and they add some new characters and they add some new storylines and stuff like that. So there is quite a lot. Now, the only thing that I didn't get on the Kickstarter was the pack with the miniatures for the monsters because I said too much plastic is just too much plastic and I've got so many miniatures in my house right now in different boxes that those tokens for monsters on the map are enough and I've got those six characters here as very well sculpted minis to be honest and I said stop. It's like you don't need those monsters for the game to play. It just looks better with all those monsters on the board, but you can do without those, right? But those expansions with the stories, if you want to get some more narrative, if you are into Skyrim like me, yeah, sure, why not? So let's right now switch over to the not so good thing that I would like to talk about and then let's do the summary. So in the not so good category, I would like to mention your strength health slash strength, because this is what the statistic is responsible for, and then your stamina and then your magicka are only ever important when you're fighting something or doing a skill test usually. And then if you're fighting, you're fighting a series of monsters in a dungeon, for example, and between each consecutive combat between one monster or the other, your stamina and your magicka regenerates, your health doesn't, but when you finish the combat successfully, your health regenerates also. So when you're traversing the map, you're always at the maximum. So it's a bit like 
you don't need to worry about any of your stats apart from while being in combat. I would still like to see some kind of a mechanic where you, okay, I, I got so clobbered in this last fight with the Dwemer, I need to get to the city in order to heal because I don't have healing potions and I can't go on the next quest or join you on the next adventure because I've got only one health left. I need healing badly. No, you just come out of combat, zoom, you're healed and that's it. So, a bit anticlimactic for me. I think that introducing something more when it comes to this mechanic would make this game a bit longer and maybe drag a bit more because you would have to go back from quest to quest to heal up and to, you know, replenish your stamina or something like that and then go on another quest. So because of that, the game rolls faster and you can do more things in less turns, but it's a bit not RPG. In, 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 this, in this case, in this regard. The other thing that I didn't really like was the fact that when you are going into the market or when you want to enchant or upgrade your gear, you do it by drawing a card from the respective deck of upgrades or gear, and then you either purchase this card, craft this card, or upgrade this, use this upgrade, or you can push your luck by paying more money or more resources in order to uncover new cards, and then you still have to spend money usually to buy the card that you want. I would still like there to be an open market that would refresh every round or something like that, so that you can see what you can get from those decks instead of just randomly drawing and spending money in order to see whether the next card you pull will be something that you might use or maybe again it will be trash and you'll have to so yeah this this management of this equipment that you can get sometimes can get a bit tiresome and that's uh, not again that's not something that i'm very convinced that an rpg that's based around gearing up your character and leveling them up is you know the best choice and the last thing i don't think mechanically again i would say is that the skills that you can you that you can level up to are divided into those three colors corresponding to strength, stamina, and magicka. But when you are leveling, you also increase your maximum strength, stamina, or magicka by one. But the rules say that you don't have to match the colors. So you can, for example, learn a skill from the magicka category, so a blue skill, but then level up your health instead. I would have it I would like to have it more tied together so that you are forced to kind of, okay, I need to upgrade my magicka so, or, or my health, so I need to choose something from the red skills that, that will be useful, and not just going here and there with that. But this mechanic, the way that it is done, it helps with saving the game and loading the game after, you know, after you take a break from the campaign, so I understand that, and it gives you a bit more flexibility with the build. And the last thing that I will mention before I finish the video, before I do the summary, is that the rulebook is written in a bit of a strange way, in my opinion. It reads a bit strange. After going through the tutorial, I was more into the rules of the game than after reading the rulebook, because it's divided in kind of an unintuitive way. There is no real glossary in the rulebook apart from the iconography glossary on the back. And some of the explanations should have examples and they don't. There aren't too many examples in the rulebook, really. For a game that has a few key mechanics, those mechanics lack very clear examples and they lack a few more examples. There is just like they're limiting themselves to one where they should have given a few with different situations to show people what's going to be done. So there is some guesswork when it comes to the rules. So let's summarize right now. If you like Skyrim, the computer game, and you're looking for a board game experience that will replicate this or at least be a bit similar, sure, this is going to be not. A disappointment. If you were or are a fan of Runebound and you like games where you have to, you know, explore the map and go on quests and sometimes meet with people and cooperate together, then Skyrim is definitely it with a strong narrative component, which is great. If you are looking for a narrative game that's not going to be the longest experience of your life, but is going to be a manageable experience with still a good story, sure, definitely. And 
it's a game which flows pretty quickly and pretty well and you have a lot of building up your character and leveling but there is not too much downtime between players so I think that this is also for a plus. On the other hand those kind of a few things that break the RPG experience like the leveling of skills and the usage of skills for your character or the fact that you never know what kind of gear you will get from your purchases and all those randomness things since still there is push your luck for the combat but the combat still can get pretty random at times then if you are annoyed by those things I don't know if people who play dungeon crawling or adventure games are annoyed with those things because this is generally the rule for combat being pretty random and dice oriented be warned that there is this there are those little grudges those little elements that i'm still complaining about and i'm still hurting off but still it's a very good game to add to your collection so in all answering the question from the beginning of the video i'm very happy that i went into this kickstarter and i backed this game and i'm definitely not going to get rid of it at least not until I get through all the stories and through all the campaigns and get to know what this game had to offer. Maybe then, because I don't know about the replayability factor. The branching stories, the branching lines are there, but it's still the same main narrative. So who knows? We'll see about that. For now, I see that for me, it's going to be a one-shot kind of a story narrative game and then it will go on the shelf. But as long as I'll be playing it, until I finish all the storylines, I'm going to enjoy myself thoroughly. Thank you for watching. My name is Lonevik. This was Skyrim, the adventure game from Modifius Entertainment. And <clears throat> I hope you found this video helpful. I hope this you found this opinion helpful. If you want to support what I'm doing here on this channel, you can always click the like button under the video, hit the subscribe and ring the notification bell to be notified about new videos on my channel. If you feel like it, there's a link in the description to this video. You want to buy me a cup of coffee. And for now, Thanks for watching, thanks for being here on my channel, have a great day, see you soon, and bye bye!